Hello, and welcome to the eighth webinar in our Radiation Safety and Wellness Webinar Series, Survey Meter Calibration. I'm Lynn McDonald, Liaison Scientist with the Radiation Safety Institute of Canada. Today, I'll be joined by Brian Bjorndahl, Director of R6 Fergal Nolan National Laboratories in Saskatoon, and Octavia Mavrici, Radiation Sa Scientist at the laboratories. Mandel Frazier from Power Yoga West in Prince Edward Island will lead us in our wellness segment beginning at 1240 Eastern. Let's take a moment to go over the functionality of the Zoom meeting. We ask that during the presentation portion that the audio and video be from the presenters only. We have found that although you can access the audio through a computer or telephone, the quality of sound tends to be better when listening from a computer. If you have technical difficulties, you can contact Maria Costa, who is with us today in the chat room, at 1-800-263-5803, extension 321. If you have questions arising from the content, please type them into the chat, as the webinar is only 40 minutes in length and is immediately followed by our wellness session. Time may not permit for us to answer all of them during the webinar. The answers will be posted on our website, along with a link to the video recording and a copy of the slides. This can be found under education webinars. I will be sending a confirmation of attendance email after the webinar and will include a link to the page with that communication. I'll also include the topics covered and the length of time spent in the webinar, as some people have requested this to send to the professional organization. Lastly, I have automatic closed captioning enabled in the slide presentation. If they are being blocked by your Zoom controls, you should be able to select a different way to view the webinar in Zoom, which makes them easier to see. The format for today is a little different than what we've been doing throughout the series, um, rather than doing an interview. We'll do the short presentation on the CNSC's regulatory expectations of calibration of survey meters. And then we're going to do a tour of the survey instrument calibration lab at the Fergal Nolan National Laboratories. And you can ask the questions as they're doing the tour of the lab. Um, it'll be Brian and Octavian taking you through. So for the final, four, uh, final 20 minutes, Mandel Frazier from Power Yoga West in Prince Edward Island will lead us through stretching and mindfulness practices um, for the wellness portion. So to start on the CNSC's expectations, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission or CNSC is Canada's regulator of nuclear sources, radiation devices, prescribed equipment and prescribed information related to nuclear sources. On their website, nuclearsafety.gc.ca, you can find guidance documents called reg docs to help with various aspects of licensing. The regulatory expectations for the calibration of survey meters are found in Appendix Z of the CNSC's Reg Doc 1.6.1, License Application Guide for, the nuclear, for Nuclear Substances and Radiation Devices. They are also found on the CNSC's website under Nuclear Substances, Class II Nuclear Facilities and Prescribed Equipment, Information for Class II Licensed Facilities. This introduction will go through these expectations in detail. Each slide title will have a description of the topic on that slide, along with the reference to, that, to the material utilizing the number system from the reg doc, followed by that for the information found online for class two. And after the slide deck or after the webinar, when the email sent out, the materials on our website will have links to these as well. For more information about the CNSC's role, please see our April 1st, 2021 webinar, Regulatory Bodies and International Agencies. The regulatory requirement to have a calibrated survey meter is specified in Section 20 of the Nuclear Substances and Radiation Devices Regulations and in subsection 18.2 of the Class II Nuclear Facilities and Prescribed Equipment Regulations. It's, they state, no person shall use, for the purposes of the Act, the regulations made under the Act, or an order or a license, a radiation survey meter that has not been calibrated within the 12 months preceding its use. Note that it says 12 months, not one year, so it's the date um, it has to be calibrated before that expiry date of 12 months goes by. In order to ensure that the requirements of the regulations are met for having a survey meter that is calibrated, 
applicants and licensees must verify that the calibration is carried out in accordance with the following expectations. So it's up to you as the licensee or the person applying to make sure that the lab that you choose to do your calibration, or if you're doing your calibration yourself, meets all these following expectations. Some are quite technical, but it's good to be aware of what they are because of this responsibility. Before calibrating any specific make and model of survey meter, the person conducting the calibration shall have available for inspection and assessment a documented calibration procedure consisting of a general description of the method of calibration, an identification and proof of verification of uncertainties associated with the jig, the source, attenuators, and decay correction, which are associated with the total uncertainty of the calibration, and step-by-step -step procedures, preferably indicating the ma including manufacturer's manuals, to show that sufficient information about the survey meter is available to operate, to perform pre-calibration checks, and to calibrate the specific survey meter. Before calibration, each survey meter shall have a pre-calibration check that consists of a battery check to ensure a satisfactory voltage can be maintained throughout the calibration, a verification of the operating voltage, and a comprehensive functional check on all ranges of the survey meter. The beam calibrator jig must be positioned to minimize radiation scatter and be at least one meter from the floor, the ceiling, and from any wall. The distance between any scattering object and the source must be at least half a meter. The beam calibrator jig must be located in the following manner, in an area free of interference from sources of ionizing radiation other than the calibration source, in an area where electrostatic, electrical and magnetic fields and other non-ionizing radiation will not affect if instrument response. The survey meter to be calibrated shall be positioned on the jig to minimize bias due to geotropism, directional dependence, and non-uniformity of the source radiation beam across and through the detector volume. And the survey meter must have any beta window or shield in the optimum position for best energy response. The uncertainty in calibration distance shall not be greater than 2% and shall be the arithmetic sum of the uncertainty of the jig distance scale, the uncertainty in the physical placement and repositioning of the survey meter, the uncertainty in the location of the source center when on the jig, and the uncertainty of the center of the sensitive volume of the survey meter detector. The survey meter to be calibrated shall have achieved equilibrium with the temperature, pressure, and humidity of the local calibration area. These parameters should be noted and shall be within the range specified by the manufacturer of the survey meter. It is recommended that the instruments are calibrated at about 20 degrees Celsius and 101.3 kilopascals or at the anticipated operational parameters. It should be noted that the response of some survey meters must be corrected for temperature and pressure. Therefore, where required, such corrections must be performed. The calibration should be carried out where the level of background radiation is known and the appropriate corrections made to compensate for the contribution from this potential source of error. This is particularly important when measuring at the lowest ranges of energy. It is preferable to use the same reference isotope as the manufacturer for the calibration source, especially if the manufacturer's specified energy response is to be assumed. Whatever isotope is used, the energy dependence of the dose rate response of the survey meter shall be known and shall be within 30% of the true dose rate over the energy spectrum of interest. The calibration source activity or exposure rate shall be known to an uncertainty of not greater than plus or minus 10%. This uncertainty shall include attenuators used singly or in combination if they are an integral part of the source assembly. A calibration source certificate shall be available for inspection, and as a minimum, the source shall be implicitly traceable through a source supplier to a national or international standard. The calibration source activity shall be corrected for, for decay at a frequency to ensure its activity is within 1% of its current value. Each survey meter shall be calibrated up to its highest range or the 10 millisiever per hour range, whichever is lower. The manu oh, I'm gonna mute there. 
the manufacturer's recommended calibration method, if any, must be followed, and the calibration shall be verified at about 20 to 25 percent and 70 to 80 percent of the measurement of each range or decade. Measurements shall be recorded before and after any necessary or preferred calibration adjustments. A survey meter shall be considered to meet the criteria for being adequately calibrated when each observed measurement is within plus or minus 20% of the expected dose rate. Measurements above 10 millisieverts per hour need not to be calibrated, but each range shall be checked to ensure response and as far as practicable by decreasing calibration distance to the appropriate increasing dose rate response shall be checked. Immediately following calibration, the person completing the calibration must complete a calibration certificate and complete and affix a durable calibration sticker bearing the date of calibration to the survey meter. The person conducting the calibration shall return the original certificate with the survey meter to the user. If a survey meter fails to meet the criteria for being adequately calibrated, the person conducting the calibration shall immediately notify the person who requested the calibration. If requested to do so, a person conducting the calibration may, if they are qualified through training or other certification, repair a survey meter before returning it to the user. Subsequent to any repair which exceeds the manufacturer's instructions for normal maintenance, a survey meter must be recalibrated. In order to meet the requirements of Section 20 of the Nuclear Substances and Radiation Devices Regulations, licensees must make available on request to the CNSC a document for each survey meter, which includes the following information. Licensee name and CNSC license supply number, sorry, survey, survey meter make and model, including serial number of the detector unit and the probe used in the calibration, if appropriate, the calibration source used, including isotope and activity, the results of the pre-calibration checks, including battery condition, operating voltage, temperature, pressure, and humidity at the time of calibration. For each range used in the calibration, the range on the survey meter that was calibrated, the expected dose rate using the calibration device, the observed dose rate on the survey meter with units, including both pre and post calibration, the calculated percent variance of the observed dose rates versus the expected dose rate, any notes of concerns or anomalies for that range, any notes of anomalies or problems associated with the calibration of the survey meter in general, the date of the calibration of the survey meter, the name and signature of the person who conducted the calibration, and acknowledgement that the calibration was carried out in accordance with these requirements that the calibration with these requirements. So it's important to know that as the licensee or that you are required to be able to produce this information. Um, if you're not getting this information back whenever you send your survey meters out to be calibrated, um, then you're not gonna be able to produce that for someone. The licensee shall retain a record of each survey meter calibration as required by the Nuclear Safety and Control Act and regulations and shall retain those records for the period specified in the license or the regulations as appropriate. Appendix Z does not have a section five, but section five is found on the regulatory expectations of calibration of survey meters page found under class two. This section outlines considerations for selecting an appropriate survey meter for accelerators, cyclotrons and sealed sources. 5.1 speaks to selecting a survey meter for an accelerator. Some accelerators such as medical accelerators produce very short pulses of high energy X-rays. For such accelerators, ion chambers are the preferred survey meters for dose rate measurements because they provide accurate measurements in pulsed radiation fields. geiger muller or GM detectors are not suitable and will not be accepted for dose rate measurements in those accelerator facilities because they typically exhibit a grossly nonlinear response to short pulses of high energy X-rays. However, they may be used for wide area scanning to identify hotspots during room surveys, provided dose rate measurements are subsequently taken with an ion chamber or other suitable instrument. Geiger-Muller detectors may also be used to measure the gamma radiation from activated components, 
or from ancillary equipment such as check sources. Other types of survey meters, such as scintillators, will be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis, but will not be accepted unless the applicant can clearly demonstrate via the manufacturer's specifications or independent testing that the instrument is suitable for use in measuring dose rates from pulsed high energy X-rays. 5.2 speaks to survey meters for suitability for cyclotrons. Instruments with analog displays, such as magnetic deflection meters, are not suitable for use in strong magnetic fields present in the immediate vicinity of cyclotrons. 5.3 speaks to survey meter suitability for sealed sources. For sealed sources, regardless of whether contained in prescribed equipment or not, gamma survey meters of any type, such as Geiger-Muller detectors, ion chambers, and scintillators, may be used if the manufacturer's operating specifications confirm that the instrument chosen is suitable for the range of dose rates and energies being measured. If a Geiger-Muller detector is to be used, energy compensated models are generally preferable, if a non-compensated Geiger-Muller is to be used, it shall be calibrated specifically for the energy of interest. So that's going through those regulatory expectations. Um, and now we're going to move on to our lab tour. I'd like to now introduce today's tour guides, Brian Bjorndal and Octavia Mavrici. Mr. Bjorndal has an MSc in nuclear physics from the University of Saskatchewan and over 20 years of experience in radiation safety and occupational health and safety in industry, academia, and research. He managed the Institute's national laboratories during its formative years and was instrumental in the development and licensing of the Institute's personal alpha dosimetry service with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. He has held positions as Director, Workplace Safety and Environmental Protection with the University of Saskatchewan and Manager of Safety and Radiation with Arriva Re Resources. He returned to us in 2017 and is now the director of the laboratories. Mr. Mavrici has an MSc in biophysics, medical imaging from the University of Ardea and an MSc in environmental subatomic physics from the University of Saskatchewan. Octavian has been with our national laboratories for 10 years and is responsible for data analysis, quality assurance and related research for all services operated in the laboratory. He also participates in delivering our training courses. We greatly appreciate them both being here with us today to give us an inside look at the calibration facility. So during the tour, we'll take questions from the participants. Um, so it's a little different than when we do the interview things, if you've been following along with us. So just, uh, you can raise your hand uh, using the, um, the Zoom controls, and then I can ask you to unmute, or you can just type them in the chat room and I'll read them out. If there are questions we don't get to, we will post the answer on the webinar page of our website and send a link to that page along with the resources to everyone once the video is processed, which will likely be early next week. So I'm going to shut off my slideshow and put uh, Brian's camera on large. So just if you have questions, raise your hand, I'll get you to speak or type in the chat room. Okay, so I just have to... I just have to find Brian. There, let's see. There you are. We'll get to one here. This is, uh, this will get started. This is, uh, I'm Brian and there's Tavi. So Tavi will be working the camera. Um, he's uh, more photogenic than me, but I'll be doing the talking and he'll be uh, uh, moving the camera around. So I'm going to hand this over to Tavi. Good. Can everybody hear me? Yep, we're um, doing fine. Uh, I'm Brian Garendal. I'm director of the National Laboratories here uh, in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Uh, uh, this lab here was started in 1989 and moved to Valley Lake. So we've been here uh, over 30 years. Um, we're sitting here in uh, just outside the calibration lab in one of our other processing labs. One of the main functions of this lab is to provide personal health and symmetry services. And we're a licensed service with the CNC. This service is provided primarily to the uranium mining industries and um, and that was one of the reasons that LAP moved to Saskatchewan to support the large uranium mining and milling uh, sector in the province. So this is one of the labs here that, uh, that does some of the major processing. Uh, among other services we provide are sealed source leak testing and instrument calibration, which is the focus of our tour uh, this morning. So uh, we'll just move on here to the calibration lab and Tabby will follow me here. 
you're one of our colleagues, one of our techs, Pam here. She's going to be on TV here, uh, working on some of the work for the Dissymmetry Service here. So, so uh, we have a dedicated calibration lab facility. Um, it's only used for that specific purpose. It's locked all of the time. And only authorized individuals that are trained um, um, to, to do calibrations have access to the facility. So it's locked all the time. To be in this lab, um, we have to wear uh, uh, external dosimeters um, uh, because it's a, a high uh, activity source to be used for calibration. So, in. follow me in here. So just a quick tour of the lab, if you can pan tell me, it's, uh, there's not much to see. It's a long, narrow lab. Uh, uh, the outside faces uh, this, the back parking lot, so it's not uh, adjacent to any other facility here. Uh, we've got lab space all around us, but uh, on the end wall is outside. Um, this is the setup here. Uh, we have a source here, which we're going to take a bigger, better look at, but we have a rail system that allows us to set the instruments at various distances from the source to achieve desired dose rates. We also have uh, a Wi-Fi types of cameras because you can imagine if the detector's way out here, it's pretty tough for the, the tech to be able to read anything off an instrument. So we can use Wi-Fi technology, Wi-Fi cameras to set it up and be able to measure, um, to measure the, uh, the, uh, the dose rates. So a few safety things. When we're working in here, we always wear good dosimeter badges. Uh, we also have um, um, electronic DRDs, which the technician will wear uh, when performing uh, performing uh, calibrations. And in the event um, that something goes wrong, uh, never has, but it, it gives us an immediate indication of dose rates around the source, and it can be set for alarming to alarm the, the technician that there is an issue and they need to take action. So, so uh, TLDs are worn, uh, DRD is worn by the technician. This is a licensed facility where we have a calibration license with the CNSC and it's posted inside the lab here. We also, because it's a sealed source, we have to do annual sealed source leak testing on this source. And we post that as well in the lab and together with any kind of a, a specific information on the source that we use, because we use a cesium-137 um, calibration source. Um, so it's a fairly straight setup. We have a workspace here, and we have a whole bunch of instrument manuals, many of which we have historically, or which we can pull from the internet or from the manufacturer's uh, websites. And we've just got placed out here a number of different gamma survey instruments that we own, but are a typical, typical of what we might calibrate here. So let's just take a better, quicker, look, quick look at the calibration source itself. You can see this device here is all shrouded in lead. So these are lead blocks that we have manufactured around here to provide additional shielding. But you can see the device right here. Tell me if I'm going too fast, Tabby. Um, this is a, a QSA uh, model 773 CZ 137 instrument calibrator. So it's a commercial device. It has its own housing and shielding. But inside that device, which is usually sealed off here, we pulled it off because it's uh, for, for time saving, it has a, a plunger in here. And inside that plunger is a, a, is the cesium-137 source. This particular source is a six gigabecrel source at the time of purchase, uh, which was around 2003, I think, Tabby. So it's, it's getting near um, uh, about 50% of its activity. Right now it's around four gigabecrels. So um, on the front here, so when I, and we'll show you the calibration, but on the front here, we have these attenuators, which are really a, a, a nice to have. And there's a 0.1, two uh, 0.1 attenuators and a 0.25. So what happens is when we're exposing instruments, we can actually move the instrument back and forth on this rail system, or we can find a kind of a sweet spot and then we can use attenuators to, to attenuate the beam without having to move the instrument. So some calibrations require us to move the instruments around, but most times we can make use of these attenuators to flatten and, and, and uh, reduce the beam um, to do the calibrations. So this is a, a NIST traceable source, and uh, we have a, do a calculation to, to do decay correction and to calculate what the expected dose rate is um, uh, based on what is desired and the, di the distance between the source and the, and the detector being tested. So I'm just going to turn. So what happens is we, what we do is when we do the calibrations here, um, uh, we usually get communications via telephone or via email from clients. And first thing we're going to ask is what kind of instrument you're going to have uh, and whether it can be calibrated by us or not. 
And uh, so we'll get some information on the model and the type. And if it's something that we can do, um, then we will add, we'll send you a requisition form, which you'll fill out and include with the instrument. And then we include any cables or any other software or tools that you might need to do the, do the calibration verification. Now I wanna make a point here. This is for gamma survey instruments, not necessarily for alpha beta. We can do those as well, but this is focusing on gamma survey instruments. So the CZ-137 emits a 660 keV gamma rate, which is kind of the industry standard for most instruments uh, uh, in terms of calibration. So that's the other question. If your instrument is really low energy design, uh, maybe this source is not appropriate. You may have to send it somewhere else. But for most instruments, probably I would say, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, probably 75 or 80% of instruments plus are, are using the CZ-137 source. So it's ideal for, for most instruments. So we'll get you to fill out any information. We'll you send that to us. And then what we'll do is we'll do a visual inspection of that. We'll start a documentation trail. And let's come around here and get some of this tab, sorry. We'll start a documentation trail on this instrument. Uh, and particular information and inspection information on that instrument. And then um, when it's ready to go, if it seems like it's working, then we will bring it in here and start to do a calibration. If your instrument has a scalar function, we do a pulsar uh, check of the, the system, make sure it's counting properly. Um, but then it will go over here to, uh, to the lab, uh, to the, the instrument calibrator for exposure. So we've got to set up here. So when we set up these instruments, we use a small application we have to set in the, the desired dose rate based on the instrument or up to 10 millisieverts per hour. So we set it up and we've this actually this instrument calibrator is fit with a tape measure and we have a tape measure as well and we have an external one. We can set it at the desired distance to achieve a certain dose rate. So this one is a, a, a Autumn S6150. We're going to turn it on here. And it's been really set up here uh, if I put it in properly to uh, uh, a distance to allow a 10 microsievert per hour, um, to 10 millisievert per hour dose rate. So if you wanna come around in the back here, Tabby, and you can, and what we'll do is we'll show you how this works. So he's gonna go behind the lead shielding here and to operate this device, and you'll notice that I have a, a, a ring badge that I wear when we do this stuff. And that actually measures my extremity dose because my hand is gonna be down here. To activate this source, there's a plunger on top and uh, what we'll do is we pull the plunger and that exposes the source. And you can see, I don't know if you can see it on the display, uh, we're looking at about 10 millisieverts per hour. And you can see this auto mess is performing quite nicely. It's about 9.75. And you can see uh, when you're doing exposures, it's, it, the instrument will fluctuate a little bit. So what you'll do is you'll sit there and you'll wait till the reading stabilizes and then the technician will take a reading. When, he's, when he or she is done taking that reading at that desired dose rate, they'll drop the plunger. And uh, what we can do is introduce an attenuator. So if I throw a, 10, a times 10 attenuator in here, I'm going to drop that dose rate by a factor of 10. If I open up the plunger again, um, you're going to see now I'm at uh, an expected dose of around one millisievert per hour. Now I should add, before we start, we do background measurements on these. Um, and we log that data as well, and we'll do any necessary background measurements. So this process continues. So uh, the reader, the technician will take that reading, and then they'll uh, drop that plunger, and they might, and they'll introduce another times 10 attenuator. And again, they'll start again. They'll lift the plunger, um, let the beam stabilize, um, and uh, let the instrument stabilize and take the reading. So they continue to do that through a number of different settings and uh, collect the data. And what we're looking for is agreement with the uh, source at that desired distance and dose rates within 20%. So Brian, we're, we're to, Brian yeah. there's just a question um, from the chat. It says the source has to be manual kept up. There's yep. no mechanical timer or whatnot to keep the source up unless the operator's hand away from the source. Not on this particular source. Now there are some where they can be pneumatically controlled or electric, electric controlled, but this one is manual. Now you might think, oh my God, I'm gonna get a huge dose. Uh, just to give you a perspective, the technician or technologist that has done this for years, uh, I think her lifetime dose was around 35 millisieverts in the extremities. And that's over after 15 or 16 years. So, um, so yeah, this is all shielded as well, but there will be a little extra dose to the hands because your hand is there. But for instrument calibrations, it's not such a big deal because you're not, you're not sitting there for long periods of time to do the calibration. 
But there are devices out there which have pneumatic controls where you can stand back, open up the shutter, and let it go. But for this particular device, it is it is manual. So we're doing a long exposure, which Tammy sometimes has to do for TLDs, because we also use it for our TLD uh, type of work. He might have to sit here for eight or ten or fifteen minutes. So he uh, and and, uh, and and expose the instrument. So it's not ideal for that, but it can be used for that. But generally, we're talking a minute or so at a time. Uh, and then you drop it, and then you would reset it. Uh, so, so we can go from really uh, fairly high dose rates, up to probably 50 millisieverts per hour, way down to um, to very low doses. So, in the low doses, we have to move the platform. We move the platform way back here. So, what we'll do is we'll move it back to a desired distance to achieve a dose rate, for example, and uh, then we do the same process. Uh, but you can imagine here's the here's the practical point. If you're standing back here, you can't see this. You can't see the redo. And this is when we start to implement the Wi-Fi types of cameras or CCD cameras to be able to look at it. So I mean, they're widely available, and uh, with an app on your phone or your iPad, you can you can uh, set it up and read the instrument um, during the exposures. Um, so, so this is what happens. So if um, uh, the instruments are exposed. And we test the performance uh, against our CZ137 source, which is decay corrected to give us the right dose rate. And, uh, and if it performs within plus or minus 20% and all the other things seem to be working properly, that's all logged on the data sheets. And then uh, a certificate, official certificate is, is generated by our technologist. And then it's reviewed as a QA measure. And then if it looks okay, uh, certificates are, or stick, certificates are printed and signed off and uh, a sticker is built and placed on the instrument. And if you come around here, Tabby, you can also see uh, what a typical survey sticker instrument looks like from us anyway. Now, we're not the only people to do this, but the process will be the same for other instrument calibrators. And, um, and they may have a different source too. So, but the principles are the same. Um, the nice thing about the one we have is that with these attenuators, it allows us to quickly vary the intensity of the field without having to physically move the instrument. Now we could easily leave the, the attenuators off and adjust the instrument, but this makes it easy and efficient for doing instrument calibrations. So no matter what type of instrument we have, as long as it's suitable for gamma measurement, we can do the same process. So we have to make sure the instrument's positioned properly because the beam has a width and a, and a depth, or width and, and height. So we have to make sure that the detector is in that beam and uh, that source separation between the source and the detector is at, at the proper distance to achieve the desired dose rate. Okay. So depending on the instrument, you saw some of these ones Tabby was showing you, we use a, a bunch of high-tech wood shims and um, things like that to, to shim it up to get it to the right dimension, right, right location. So that's not very high-tech, but it's very effective because it's only temporary. So we have a lot of little wood shims and things that we can do to get that detector at the right height so that it's right in the beam of the instrument calibrator. Brian, um, yeah. a couple more questions here. Um, as per ISO 4037, the distance between the source and the instrument should be a minimum five times the size of the detector. Um, is that five times the size of the source? Um, so do you check the instrument's detector size to see if it meets the criteria? Um, but is it five times the source or five times the detector size? I don't. Sorry. Hmm? Sorry? I, I'll pull up that ISO. Parth, are you sure it's the detector size or is it the source size? Size, you want it to accumulate a point source. Um, so uh, these sources on the cesium source, uh, they're tiny little um, pellets on the, on the bottom of the source. So uh, generally, we're not, it's, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, and even the probes in these detectors are quite small. So I don't think there's an issue in terms of the five times if okay. you're talking about the detector or the source. Okay. But, uh, but should never be an issue. And then now, is, is the plus or minus 20% including or excluding the measurement uncertainty? That would be including the measurement uncertainty. So it should perform to within 20%. That's it, yeah. So I mean, the source itself is uh, rated to be plus or minus 5% um, in terms of its delivered dose rate. And, um, and then the distance has to be within plus or minus 2%. So we, we're quite particular about how we position it. And if it doesn't, you know, one of the first things we check, if it looks like it's off, is we make sure we check to see if it's in the right position in terms of it's uh, uh, aligned with the beam and it's, it's distance from the source. Um, so we keep, we'll recheck those if we seem to see a potential issue. Another thing we can do with these sources is we just use a, um, 
um, a simple stopwatch, but into some of the instruments are integrating to give you dose received as well. So if the instrument does have that capability, uh, our tech will actually expose the detector for a known amount of time and see what the total integrated dose is. And we do that for electronic dosimeters, for example. So we do these as well. Uh, they will measure dose rate, but they also measure your total dose or your emission dose while being worn. So um, they can be tested not only for dose rate, but to see if they're integrating the dose properly over a predefined period of time. Um, okay. okay, and just coming back to the chat, because I know you're, you can't see on the phone there. Um, no. So yes, the, it was confirmed by uh, Paris and Aaron. Uh, it should be the detector size compared to the distance of source. That's that's me not knowing that because I don't have all those details of the ISO right. ones. The other is there a capability to have a body phantom in your range, such as required under ANSI N forty two thirty two twenty sixteen for RPDs and Homeland Security use, which might just be a U.S. requirement. Uh, you could use a phantom, but we don't have one here. But I mean, it could be. I mean, if you had a phantom, you could expose it for different types of uh, types of purposes, for sure. Yeah. But we don't, right here, we do not do that at this particular lab. But you could. I mean, you could use it for, for dissimilar purposes if you have a proper phantom. Okay. Um, uh, Richard's asking, how do you ensure the survey meter is set up centrally in the beam axis? You mentioned the wood shims, but so, you might. Yeah. So we've got schematics on the cesium source. And we know the center of the height, so we actually measure up from the table and then away and then away from the source, so we can get within the beam. And the beam spreads out quite quite nicely. Um, um, and there's a um, with the manual uh, for the source and the, our documentation. There's there's a table on what that beam size is and dimensions are based on your distance from the source. So really, it's uh, it's it's uh, we do just physical measurements to get it at the right distance from the source and at the right height. And, um, and we confirm that um, before we do the measurements. And again, if we do see uh, anomalies with the measurement, that's the first thing we're gonna check is to make sure it's sitting in the, um, in the right zone. Right. And really uh, uh, yeah. also for some survey meters, which may have a certain point of measurement marked, can you set up to that position or depth? Uh, so you see on this one here, it actually tells you where the detector is. Um, again, um, some instruments um, will not say that. But I mean, um, they all have, uh, some instruments will have marks on them where the detector is. I don't think this one does. It has the ribs here. That may be where the detector is. But I mean, depending on the instrument, um, we'll check the manual to determine where that detector is if we don't know. But the idea you're right is to make sure that because the detectors have width and dimensions to them, making sure that we're getting uh, the detector um, uh, in the right, right location. So whether it's the center of the detector or at the face of the detector, we can determine from the operations manual. Because that can make it particularly, sorry, I'm just gonna scooze around here, particularly in some detectors like these here. I mean, um, is, are you measuring to the face of the ion chamber or to the center of the ion chamber? So we make sure that stuff's all determined uh, during, during the calibration to make sure that we're, we're getting it right. So, so Brian, just as a question, um, mm -hmm. you had said earlier that the lab there has a certification from the CNSC. That you had pointed that out. We uh, actually historically, it, historically the uh, CNSC required all instrument calibrators. I think it was R. Now correct me if I'm wrong. Is either R one sixteen or R one seventy? One was for calibration and one was for leak testing. But in back in the day, and I'm dating myself, you used to have to uh, meet the criteria. I'm going to call R one sixteen. If it's R one seventy, I apologize. And you had to uh, you had to apply for approval. It wasn't you didn't get a license. You, you became an approved. Um, instrument calibration facility uh, and you would be on a list. So it wasn't a license you had to get, it was really an approval and a staff based on your program and it had to meet R116. But at some time in, the, in that between then and now, the Institute or the CNSC has moved away from that. And the idea is to allow licensees to do their own calibrations if so desired. So they've specified what the expectation is in terms of the calibrations as uh, uh, Lynn has indicated in that Appendix Z. And it's up to the um, to the licensee to, to ensure that they're sending it to a facility that can perform calibrations in line with the CNC requirements, or if they decide to do it themselves, you're, you're meeting those requirements yourself. Well, for most clients, it's just not worth it because you have to buy this source, which is quite expensive. You need a calibration license for that, and you need trained people to do it. So if you have a lot of instruments, it might be economically feasible, but for most people, folks, it's just not, it's just not worth it. But in theory, though, the CNC is open the door that you can 
for yourself if you want, but you have to meet this required requirement. And it's all auditable by the CNC. So they can come and go, hey, show us what you're doing for instrument calibration, how you're doing it, are you meeting the requirements and what records you're keeping? So on that as well, so we keep all the records of our instrument calibration. Um, if an instrument fails, we'll be in contact with the, with the manufacturer. We keep all these records here on file as well. So you get copies of them and we keep copies uh, on file. And we don't actually, I don't think we've ever disposed of them. We've been doing this for almost 20 years. So we have records dating back um, uh, almost 20 years when we first started this uh, service. But back in the day when we first started, we did need a C to C approval. But right now, as it stands now, um, it's, uh, it's really you need to follow the guidelines or the requirements specified by the CMC. Okay, great. And that's our 40 minutes up. It's time for the wellness. So, um, oh, just let's do one more. Is the overload test part of the calibration or is it done separately on request? Um, to, to overload the instrument? Um, no, we don't normally do that. We just do it at the maximum dose rate of the instrument uh, uh, or to 10 millisieverts per hour. Now, it depends on your instrument. We may not be able to overload it um, because it depends on its capacity, right? We can probably go to 50 millisieverts per hour. Uh, based on our current activity source, um, and that's right up against the source. Um, so that uh, that may not be high enough, and in fact, it likely is not high enough for a lot of moderate survey instruments, unless it's a low a low exposure rate type of instrument. So um, no, we don't normally do that. Uh, if it's asked, we can try, but again, I mean, at 50 millisieverts per hour, uh, it's not likely we're going to overload it on a lot of instruments. All right. Well, thank you, Octavian and Brian. And um, this was great. Uh, we, we didn't know. We thought we'd take a chance and uh, see how the tech went, and it went fine. So thanks to everyone. If people have further questions, if you type some in the chat, I can send them to Brian and, and Octavian afterwards. We do have um, our 1-800 number type of thing. So um, you can always get in touch with us. Um, online or calling 1-800-263-5803 or email us at info at radiationsafety.ca for any type of radiation question. So um, that's part of our free, we're not for profit. Um, and we just try to get radiation safety inf uh, information out there, whether it's ionizing or non-ionizing. So at this time, um, I'm gonna find Mandel. She's going to lead us through our wellness because it's important for us to take care of our, our, our physical wellness as well. I just have to find, there she is. So thank you, Brian and Octavian. I know that um, it's a bit nerve wracking to walk around and hope that everything goes well, but I think it went very well. So thanks very much. We're just waiting here, so we're good. We're all, <laughs> all right. So uh, Mandel, I made you co-host. If you want to take over? Yeah, lovely. Thanks guys. See you. Bye. See Bye. Bye Octavian. So for those of you um, who can stay, uh, we, we encourage you that uh, during the pandemic or even beforehand, a lot of us spend a lot of time sitting and um, not necessarily taking care of our physical well-being. And that's why we bring the wellness portion along with our radiation safety. So I think, do I have to end the spotlight? Are you able to take over there, Mandel? Pardon me? Are you able to take over? Okay, let me do this. Did that work? Okay. There we go. There we go. Great. Okay, um, so we're going to do a bit of yoga um, as well as some breath work and some meditation just to get the body moving and just to kind of find a few minutes to sit with ourselves. Um, which is so important, I think, in this busy, crazy world we live in. So I just want you to make sure you have a little bit of space between you and a desk if you have a desk in front of you. But we're not going to move a whole lot. We'll stay pretty much seated. So just enough space that if you come up with stand, you're not going to knock it in. But I just want you to begin by taking your seat bones a little bit closer towards the edge of your chair. Sit nice and tall. Feel your feet just kind of start to press into the ground beneath you. And close your eyes. And I just want you to begin to kind of acknowledge the breath and, and how the breath is moving in the body. So without doing anything to change it, 
Just acknowledge how it moves into the body, where it kind of hits along the way. And same as the exhale. So how does the breath leave the body? Do you notice your chest moving? Your belly moving? Maybe your shoulders move? But what I want you to do now is I just want you to see if you can extend the breath a little bit longer. So as you breathe in, can you take the breath in through the nostrils, into the back of the throat, feel the chest lift, as well as feel the belly lift. So an inhale, it's just kind of this uplifting feeling of the breath as the breath moves into the body. And then as you exhale, you're just gonna move the breath from the belly, from the chest, from the back of the throat, out through the nostrils if you're comfortable with that, or out through the mouth if that's more comfortable. And as you let the breath go, I just want you to feel this sense of kind of letting go of, maybe it's stress, maybe it's tension, maybe it's just kind of staleness from sitting around most of the day. Whatever it is that you kind of need to let go of, Feel that move with the exhale breath. And then you just create this really nice ebb and flow of the breath moving into the body and the breath moving out of the body. Now, just to find a bit more length to it, I want you to add a count. So as you breathe in, you can count one, two, three, four. Maybe taking just a little pause there at the top. And then as you breathe out, you're going to exhale for four, three, two, one. And again, you'll take that little pause at the bottom. So breathing in one, two, three, four. Breathing out four, three, two, and one. I just want you to stay with that for a minute longer. If you feel that you have the breath span to take the count of five, go ahead and do that. But again, just creating this nice ebb and flow of breath. And just by slowing down the breath, you'll notice that you might start to feel more relaxed, more at ease. Because when we slow down the breath, when we're more mindful of the breath, it has just this really soft, nurturing effect on the nervous system. So stay with that count for two more breaths. And then as best as you can, I want you to stick with that inhale and exhale through the nostrils, nice and long. But go ahead, drop. You're going to start to move. So again, feel that little bit of pressure of your feet on the floor beneath you. A little bit of pressure of your seat bones grounding down into your chair. Sit nice and tall. We're going to take an inhale breath. Reach your arms up and overhead. Now as you exhale, you're just going to drop your left arm along the side of your chair. You can sit it on top of your left thigh. You're going to take your right fingers towards your left ear. And you're just going to drop your right ear towards the shoulder.
Now, if you want to deepen that a little bit more, you can take the left hand and you'll just start to reach through the fingertips. And then you can kind of play around with lifting it up or moving it down. But what you should feel is just this nice little stretch moving along the neck into the top of the shoulder. So taking that deep inhale breath. You're going to stay for the exhale breath. Now go ahead, just drop your right hand down. You're going to take your left arm now up and over. So reach that left hand up towards the right side of the Take a few breaths into your left arm. H long. Breathing in. Breathing out. Now on your next inhale breath, you're going to take that left arm straight up. Go ahead and reach the right arm up as well. Take a nice deep inhale breath. You're going to take your thumbs up. Once you have that, you're just going to feel as if you're trying to push your chest through your shoulders there, maybe even your head a little bit. Feel the chest lift up as the fingers reach towards the back of your Breathe in. Just wind out your feet a little bit more. It's going to be a space. As you breathe out, you're going to slowly let your arms fall heavy towards the floor as you melt your chest, just kind of in between the thighs there, let your head be nice and heavy. The counter pose for that is you're going to take your hands to the back of the head, and then you're just going to tuck your chin in toward your chest. On your next inhale breath, just go ahead and let the arms come heavy. Find your way back up to sitting. Arms reaching up and overhead, take a deep breath in. As you breathe out, you're going to take your right hand just kind of down along the side of your chair or onto your back. You're going to reach your left fingertips towards your right ear. And then you'll just gently drop your left shoulder or left ear, sorry, down towards your shoulder. And then you have the option there with that right hand if you want to reach through the fingertips and like move it around a little bit there. Maybe even notice that you, now that you have kind of a greater sense of your breath, control of your breath, you can even take it to that space that's finding the length and that's opening up. So breathing into the neck, the top of the shoulder. Left arm is just going to fall heavy again either to the side of the chair or onto the thigh. Right arm now is going to reach up and overhead. Stay nice and grounded in the both sequence. On your next inhale breath, come back up to center. Both arms reaching up towards the ceiling. Again, you're going to hook your thumbs. If you remember which direction, switch it up. And then same thing, just sitting nice and tall. You're going to feel the chest kind of draw forward. Gaze might come up, but it's almost like you're trying to reach your fingers towards the back of your Take one more breath in. As you breathe out, slowly release your hands, let your chest melt down towards the floor. Once the head becomes heavy, you're going to take your hands again to the back of the head, and then it's just going to be a little tuck of the chin in towards the chest, so you feel it kind of grow to the back and the neck open up. Let your arms become heavy on your next inhale breath. Slowly come on up. Take your time. Once again, reach the arms up and overhead. 
You're going to start to ground down into your feet as you exhale. You're going to press the stance. So you're going to stand tall. At the same time, you're going to take your hands in front. You're going to clasp onto your fingers. Draw your knuckles down as you lift your chest up. Take a nice deep breath in here. As you breathe out, just slowly release your hands. Reach them up and overhead. Take a nice deep inhale breath. Gonna be like you're sitting back towards your chair, but you're gonna stop into a, a chair pose. So not letting the seat bones come back to your chair. Take a nice deep breath in. Just sink a little bit lower. Breathe out. You're gonna press to stand. So as you inhale, come on up to stand. Nice and tall. As you exhale, you're gonna take your hands and press them in behind. Inhale, reach your arms up. Exhale, it's gonna be chair pose. We're going to do that one more time. Extend the legs long, breathe in. Take your hands and behind, chest comes forward, breathe out. As you reach your arms up, you're going to sink into chair pose, inhale. Go ahead, just drop your hands towards your chair and sink the seat forward back into your chair as you exhale. Good. Once there, you're going to take a hold of that right knee, whether you want to wrap around the knee or kind of behind your thigh there, it's your choice. You're going to draw your knee in towards your chest. Sit so nice and tall here. And then just go ahead, point and flex through your foot. Okay, take a breath in. Now, as you breathe out, you're going to extend the leg long. You're going to set your heel down to your mat or floor. As you inhale, you're going to reach the arms up. As you exhale, it's just like you're going to reach towards your toes, stopping where it kind of starts to feel like there's a little pull there. On your inhale, right, lift the arms back up. As you exhale, you're going to gather your knee back in towards your chest. Squeeze that knee and sit tall, breathe in. Now you're going to take your right foot on top of your left thigh, breathe up. Now, as best you can, try to let that right knee open up and then get a little on the top. Sit tall once again, inhale. And again, as you exhale, you're just going to begin to pull. And it's just kind of whatever feels accessible for you. So it should feel a little like it's a little bit of a tug there, but nothing painful. Okay, on your inhale, breath lift back. On your exhale breath, gather the knee in towards the chest to the side. Second side, so you're going to get it onto that left foot, draw the knee, or left knee, sorry, draw it in towards the chest, sit nice and tall. And then just point to flex through that left push. Okay, now go ahead, extend that left leg long. Drop your heel down towards your wall. Keep that foot nice and active. Breathe in, lift the arms out. And then you'll just begin to pull the chest forward on your breath out, stopping wherever you start to feel that little pull there. Good. Okay. As you breathe in, come on back up. Draw your knee back in towards your chest. You're going to place now your left foot on top of your right thigh. Again, as much as you can, let that knee open up. Again, without pushing it, without forcing it. Take an inhale, and then as you exhale, you may be in a pull. And on your next breath in, come on up. Gather your left knee in towards your chest, and then as you breathe out, set the foot down. And then I just want you to get comfortable in your chair. So you may just scoot the seat bones back, let your back rest into the chair, let your arms become heavy. Seat bones just kind of sinking into the chair, feeling just nice and relaxed here. As best you can, let go of any tension. Maybe it's hesitation. Maybe it's a negative emotion. Are you going to come into 
to a meditation called Place of Contentment. So just a really great meditation if you find that the world might be feeling a little bit heavy and you need to come to a place that feels a little bit more like hope. So I want you to begin here by just focusing on a place that, that brings you comfort. It might be a space in your house. It might be a place you like to vacation. It might be a place that brought you comfort as a child. But I just want you to imagine yourself sitting in that space. So as best we can visualize it. From the colors, the smell, who's around you. Visualize this space as best you can. Feeling safe here. Feeling at peace here. Imagining this space in great detail. Imagining what you see surrounding you. Is there something off in the distance? It's close. Easing all around you, taking it in as best you can. As you continue to sit in this space, you may even begin to notice smaller details that you might have first missed. What sounds can you hear? Is it loud sounds? Is it soft sounds? Are they in the distance or are they close? Are you eating or drinking anything? If so, how does that food taste? How do your clothes feel on you? Are you in shorts and t shirt or bundled up? Is there any sense in the air? Sitting in this space, feeling peaceful, finding comfort, relaxed. You don't feel rushed, there's no time limit. Just sitting here, relaxed, and at peace. Thoughts have a powerful way to change how we feel. So if we think of something happy, we feel happy. 
if we think that something sad we feel sad. If we visualize this space of contentment, we feel content. So before we we leave here, know that this space is always there for you to find. Even for a brief moment. But know that when you come into this space, that you find that comfort, that peace. Even when things around you might feel a bit crazy, chaotic, or heavy. So just before moving to lunch, start to feel maybe just a sprinkle of sensation in the body. So wiggling fingers, toes, maybe rotating wrists, ankles. Deep in the breath, so taking a nice deep inhale and exhale. And just begin to sit a little bit taller as you take your next breath in. You're going to reach your arms up and overhead. As you breathe out, you're going to draw your hands to heart center, and we'll just finish with a nuts. So, namaste to you all. Take care. Thank you so much, Mandel. We appreciate having you here um, to lead us through the yoga practice and meditation. So okay. for those that were able to stay right to the end, um, thank you for coming. Um, next week, I'm doing training courses, so there will not be a webinar, but we'll be back um, the week after with one on uh, preparing for uh, x-ray inspection in an industrial environment. So thanks again, Mandel. Thank you. Take care. See everyone again. Bye.